Good morning. Welcome to our worship together this Sunday, the 29th of March. For many of us, it will be the first week of homeschooling, uh, the first full week of being in the house inside. So let us raise our hearts and our voices uh, together to God as we virtually meet together. As many of you will be aware, the clocks moved forward an hour last night, uh, but for those who have not realized that, we uh, will probably not notice if you slip in amongst us an hour late. This morning, we start a series uh, by our vacancy convener, Reverend Nigel Craig, from the book of Philippians, a letter from Paul from imprisonment, essentially a form of self-isolation, uh, to his friends in Europe, covering, amongst other themes, uh, the theme of joy in the midst of suffering. Our praise this morning will be from previous recordings of congregational praise, uh, and the words will appear on screen uh, to hopefully help us worship God together. The Church Magazine is now back from the printers, and we aim to get that to you during this coming week, together with the updated Church Telephone Directory. If you usually contributed to the church at Sunday morning services, which accounts for 70% 70, 70 of our normal church income, uh, there will be details in the church magazine of how you could do that by direct transfer. The church office is now closed to the public and to personal callers, but you can still contact Nicola there by uh, telephone or by email. As last week, there is no tea and coffee served after this service, unless you make this yourself. But again, I would encourage you to do that and then to phone someone you think will be on their own uh, or to contact people by other means, such as Zoom, WhatsApp, or FaceTime, and also to continue to do that through the week uh, and seek to encourage one another. So let us worship our great God together now. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ and welcome to this service of worship. Let me begin with our call to worship which is taken from Psalm 40. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction out of the miry bog and set my feet upon a rock making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Forever to the King of Kings. 
I hope you're all well. Um, normally at this point in the service we do the birthday bucket um, but we can't do that as easily when we're not together um, and I've been told that there are no birthdays this week. If that's wrong though and it is your birthday then please when we're back at church come and take something from the birthday bucket to celebrate your birthday from the church. But before I pray for you I just want to share a wee thought with you. This week while I've been at home and I'm at home just like the rest of you at the minute um, I've been thinking about the story of Jesus calming the storm. And there's just something about that story that I can't get out of my head. Um, and there's two little points to it that I want to share with you. So while Jesus was in the boat and when this storm was happening, the first thing that he did was he slept. Now Jesus, when he lived on earth, was fully human and he had been walking from town to town preaching and telling people about God and healing doing miracles telling parables and he was just really tired and so he got into the boat lay down and fell asleep the second thing is though that he slept the whole way through the worst of the storm right to the point where the disciples who were used to being on the sea of Galilee and were used to storms, were fishermen, until they were completely terrified and they screamed in their fear at him, wake up, Jesus. And it's often, it's been intriguing me a little bit this week as to why Jesus was still asleep until that point. And I think the thing was that he knew who was in control of that moment. So he was at complete peace and slept because he knew the thing that was in control was not the storm. The thing that was in control was his father God and he didn't need to fear the storm because God was bigger than the storm that was happening. And when he woke up and he saw the disciples fear, he told the, the storm to be quiet, to be still. And then he turned to the disciples and said, why were you scared? Why were you scared? Did you not know God was in control? And it feels a little bit like we are in the middle of a storm at the minute. And some of you may be a wee bit scared or anxious or unsure what's going on. But we need to remember, like Jesus knew, that God is bigger than this storm. And that God is in control. Now, I have a friend called Sally. And Sally's written some books. And this is one of the books she's written. Oh, it's back to front for you. But it's called Thoughts That Make My Heart Sing. And I just want to read you this one little one. And it says that called don't be afraid and it says this whenever God talks to his children in the bible do you know what he usually says first hello how do you do no he says don't be afraid 
God must not want his children, even for a moment, living anxiously or afraid. He wants his children to trust him. Are you worried about something today? Is something frightening you? God says to you, don't be afraid. I am with you. I will help you. Whatever it is, you can put it in God's hands. Let's remember that God is in control. He is bigger than any storm. We're going to sing the song that we sing in Gleam. Um, I haven't sung it with you in church yet, but I know you've done it a couple of times called I'm Counting on God. And in the chorus of it, it says joy unspeakable that won't go away. Just enough strength to live for today. So I never have to worry what tomorrow will bring because my faith is on solid rock. I'm counting on God. Let me pray and then we'll sing the song together. Dear God, we thank you that even though we're apart, we can be together. And we just pray that as we're watching this together online, as we are singing together, as we're thinking about you together, that you will be with us, that you will help us, that you will take away our fear and you help us to know that you are always in control. Amen. Let's sing this song together and I hope that I'll see you again really soon. Bye. pray together. Father, we know from your word that you are a God who loves to rescue. This is most apparent in the gospel. You gave us your son, Jesus Christ. He came down to the pit of this world and took upon himself the mud and the mire of our sins when he died on the cross. And you have given us your Holy Spirit 
to lead us to trust in Christ and then put a new song in our mouths, a song of grace and peace. In fact, you who did not spare your own son but gave him up for us all, how will you not also along with him graciously give us all things? And so we, your people, have experienced you res your rescue on countless occasions throughout our lives. We say thank you. Father, we acknowledge that our world, continent and country is currently in a very deep pit, stuck in the mire of a very serious pandemic and struggling with the immense consequences of this socially and economically. We pray that you would have mercy upon us and rescue us. We readily confess that we do not deserve your mercy, rather the very opposite, for we have turned our backs on you, we have resisted your rule, we have scoffed at your ways and rejected your offer of salvation in Christ, both corporately and individually. Indeed, there is no health in us, physically or spiritually. Father, you do all things in accordance with the counsel of your will, and so we pray that by the work of your Holy Spirit, there will be a considerable turning back to you and embracing of Jesus Christ as Saviour and Lord and a new reverence for you and your ways and an end to this virus. So having experienced your rescue, may a new song be found in our mouths, a song of grace and peace, a song sung across Ireland, the continent of Europe, indeed throughout this world. A song that says, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honour, glory and might, for ever and ever. Amen. We turn to the New Testament and to the book of the uh, Philippians, Paul's letter to the church at Philippi. Philippians chapter 1, reading verses 1 to 11. This is God's word. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi, with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion in the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all, because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defence and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. Amen. Let's ask God's help now as we come to think about these words together. Let us pray. Father, I pray that the words of my mouth and the thoughts of all our hearts, wherever we might be this morning, would be pleasing in your sight through Jesus Christ our Lord, who is our rock and our redeemer. Amen. No doubt many of you have missed meeting with family and friends in person uh, over this past week. Now we all know that the government enforced lockdown in response to the, to the coronavirus isn't going to end anytime soon and so we all need to make an extra effort uh, to stay in touch whether that's over the phone, by sending a text message, by using social media or by sending a card or a letter in the post. Whenever you're phoning texting or emailing your family or friends, what sort of things do you say to them? I'm sure you say things like, how are you? Are you well? Are you keeping safe? How are you managing? Is there anything that I can help you with? Yes, there have been some fun videos posted online 
particularly in relation to toilet rolls. But much of our correspondence has lost its frivolity. We're more likely to dwell on weightier matters. Now, Tony and I received uh, several heartwarming messages assuring us of prayer in recent days. And it's probably true that this national emergency has led many of us to pray more than we regularly do. But the question that I want to ask this morning is, how exactly should we be praying or what should we be praying for? Now, we'll obviously be wanting to pray for one another's health and safety, for recovery for those who've been infected, grace for those who are seriously ill, comfort for the bereaved, strength for our doctors, nurses, physios, pharmacists, and all who work in our hospitals and support them. Pray for stamina and protection for all who work in our essential services and our shops, banks, transport systems, and guidance for those in business and wisdom for those in government. But how might we pray for one another as brothers and sisters in Christ, particularly at this time when we can't meet together? I wonder if Paul were amongst us, how would he instruct us to pray? Well, from reading Paul's letters to individuals and churches in the New Testament, we can see how he prayed and in that way receive mentoring for how we should pray. So today I would like to consider uh, Philippians chapter 1 verses 1 to 11 in which we find Paul's prayer for the church in Philippi, a prayer that has elements of both thanksgiving and petition. And over these next few months, if God wills, uh, I would like to take the little book of Philippians and together walk through this short epistle. Uh, last week in my live stream message on Belmont Presbyterian Facebook page, I shared a few thoughts uh, on the account of the founding of that church in Philippi by Paul. And you can read about that in Acts chapter 16. But you may remember by the end of the book of Acts, and Paul was under house arrest in Rome, awaiting his appeal to Caesar. And yet, even being in house arrest or under house arrest, he enjoyed relative freedom. However, it appears by the time that the letter to the Philippians had been written, uh, the situation had deteriorated. He was now in chains and it looked like he might be facing execution. Now, one might have expected Paul to have written in a low mood. On the contrary, we read through his short letter. As we read through this short letter, we are surprised by joy. And I'm stealing a phrase there from C.S. Lewis. For in this letter, Paul writes the following. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. So this wee piece of apostolic correspondence pulsates with gratitude for the Philippians' friendship and generosity during his incarceration, and it overflows with love and with joy. Now, for the Latin scholars amongst you, uh, the letter has been summarised in the following pithy saying, Summa epistolae gaudeo gaudete. That is, the sum of the letter, I rejoice now you rejoice. Now, although Paul's circumstances aren't exactly the same as ours, there are some parallels. Many of us today feel imprisoned within our own homes. Most of us are unsure of what the future holds, and some of us are quite scared for our lives. So it's really important that we spend time with a mature Christian who can steady us and put courage into our souls. And what Paul wrote uh, concerning the Old Testament, Romans 15 and 4, is applicable to us whenever we consider his writings. Whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Now, of course, our ultimate hope is not to be found in Paul, but in Christ, the one whom Paul loved and served. So how might Paul, the Apostle of Joy, encourage us to pray in these difficult days? Let's turn to Philippians 1, 1 to 11, and let me suggest five prayer points. Let's thank God that we are partakers in his grace, that we are partners in the gospel. Then let's pray for our progress in the faith, 
buoyed on by the promises of God and all to his praise. So first of all, partakers. In verse 7, Paul writes, you are all partakers with me in grace. Now whilst he may have been making specific reference to the grace or the honour of witnessing and suffering for Christ, we can also reflect on the bigger theme of grace that we've seen in these few verses. In the very first verse, Paul and Timothy acting as his scribe, wishes the congregation in Philippi along with their leaders grace and peace. Verse 2. What is it that we need today? What is it that we really need? I think that we all need an assurance of God's grace and of his peace. No doubt you know the meaning of the word grace. It's extravagant, uncalled for, undeserved kindness on God's part to us sinful people. And as Paul indicates three times in these first two verses, God's grace is shown to us and it is found in the person of his son Jesus Christ, the one who lived for us, died for us and rose for us. Consequently, in Jesus Christ we're no longer alienated from God, but we have peace with him objectively and then we begin to sense that peace subjectively. We may then wonder if God offers us this grace and peace, how do we become partakers in it and in them? Well, remember uh, last week, for those of you who saw that uh, video, when whenever we considered the founding of the church in Philippi in Acts chapter 16, we thought about two individuals, a businesswoman called Lydia and an anonymous jailer. We read that God opened Lydia's heart to embrace the message about Jesus that Paul had shared with her. And we also read that the jailer believed in Jesus Christ and was saved. He was rescued. They both became partakers of God's grace in Christ whenever he opened their hearts and they believed in Christ personally. Now, some of you may recall question and answers 29 and 30 of the Westminster Shorter Catechism. How are we made partakers of the redemption purchased by Christ? We are made partakers of the redemption purchased by Christ by the effectual or the effective application of it to us by his Holy Spirit. And how does the Holy Spirit apply to us the redemption purchased by Christ? The Spirit applies to us the redemption purchased by Christ by working faith in us and thereby uniting us to Christ in our effectual calling. John Calvin put it this way, the gospel appears as nothing to us in respect of any enjoyment of it until we receive it by faith. To put it simply, the Holy Spirit opens our hearts to believe the gospel which we've heard and he enables us to embrace Jesus, to receive him by faith. And in this way, we are made partakers in God's grace and find peace. I thank God that many of you are already partakers of God's grace. However, it may be that some of you who are watching this have not yet become a partaker in God's grace. You haven't yet embraced Jesus Christ by faith. You haven't yet received him into your lives, nor have you received that peace of God that comes with him. Well, today is the day of rescue in these uncertain days. And I would urge you to receive Jesus to embrace him by faith and then you will partake in God's grace and peace. Secondly, partners. We are to give thanks that we are partners. In verse 5, Paul thanks God for their partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Now as we've heard that partnership began in Acts chapter 16, more laterally, they had shown the depth of their partnership by sending Paul financial help by the hand of Epaphroditus, one of the members of the congregation. Paul was deeply grateful for their fellowship, their koinonia, their commonality, their sharing. Now, sometimes in church circles, we refer to the drinking of a cup of tea together as fellowship. Nambari or Panjana may have a lubricating role to play, but fellowship goes much deeper than that. Partnership. Or fellowship should have the following characteristics. It should be fellowship in the gospel, verse 5. 
if you're a member of a gym, a golf club, a tennis club, a running club, a rugby club and so on, what do you have in common with the other members? Is it not your love of a particular sport? What should members of the church primarily have in common? Yes, we can have a shared history and a loyalty to a particular location and congregation, but of greater significance is our love for Jesus Christ and his gospel. And you know, whenever people are agreed upon that, of who Jesus is and what he's done, then you'll find true partnership and fellowship, even if they're from diverse backgrounds, socially, economically, ethnically, and so on. True partnership is also evident in how people feel about one another. Uh, Paul, in these verses, writes to the Philippians, I hold you in my heart, verse 7. And he's the one who longed for the congregation with the, with the affection of Jesus Christ, verse 8. It's just wonderful when love is shared within a congregation. And true partnership is displayed in how the Philippians supported Paul in his imprisonment. To be truly united in Christ means that we stand by one another and we aid one another, particularly when times are hard. Already, some within our congregations, indeed many within our congregations, are reaching out to the lonely and the vulnerable, and we give thanks to God for that. And true partnership is evident in the defence and confirmation of the gospel. Verse 7, for those who love Jesus Christ and his gospel, who love one another and support one another will also be united in their desire to defend and commend the gospel. Thirdly, progress. Paul, having thanked God in prayer that the Philippians are partakers of God's grace and are partners in the gospel, he now turns to pray for them. That is, he requests from God that they progress in the faith and that they are reassured by God's promises. And what areas does Paul pray for progress? In verse 9, he prays that their love for one another would abound, that is, grow more and more. Now, we've already touched on the theme of love, Paul's love for them. He now wants them to increase in their love for one another. What does Paul understand by love? Well, it hasn't much to do with red roses, chocolates or butterflies in the stomach. Rather, it's much more grounded and fulsome than that. You can see Christian love spelled out in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. This kind of love is only possible as we are united in Christ and to Christ and indwelt by the Spirit. As Paul says in Romans 5 and 5, God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given to us. Paul then prayed that they would also grow in knowledge and in all discernment. Verse 9. The knowledge, according to the Bible, isn't just an accumulation of facts about God. It's primarily experiential and relational. So I could say I know the Prime Minister, Boris Johnston. That is, I know things about him, but I don't actually know him personally or have a friendship with him. To know God is to know him personally, to love him and to trust him in increasing measure. And in these days of trial, Let's get to know God better as we trust him more. Discernment, on the other hand, is the ability to distinguish between right and wrong, both in doctrine and in life. Paul writes that an increase in discernment should help the Philippians to approve what is excellent. The great 4th, 5th century preacher John Chrysostom comments in these verses, Paul prays that they will not receive any corrupted doctrine under the pretense of love. So love does not exclude discernment. Love does not rule out the need for the Christian to make judgment calls between what is right and what is wrong. In fact, true love does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. And discernment is desperately needed in today's world. Drawing our thoughts to a close this morning, you may be wondering how, as a Christian, you're going to make progress in love knowledge and discernment. Indeed, how are you going to cope over the next weeks and months with all the uncertainty that this crisis will bring? Well, Paul reassures us on two occasions in these verses that what God has started, he will finish. That is his promise. Verse 6, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion 
at the day of Jesus Christ. And in verse 10, he writes about us being pure and blameless on the day of Jesus Christ. Now, whenever Paul uses this phrase, he's referring to the final day when Jesus Christ returns in person in resplendent glory and all people will see him, fall before him and acknowledge him as Lord. God has promised that he will keep his people, that he will keep us, that he will hold us fast, even in these, these disconcerting days until that day. Finally, Paul prays that God would receive the praise. The ultimate credit for all that happens in our lives belongs to God. He deserves the praise for making us partakers of grace, partners in the gospel, for ensuring that we make progress and for keeping his promises to us. So what should we be praying for in these days? Well, let's thank God that we are partakers in his grace and that we're partners in the gospel. And let's pray for his spirit's help in these difficult today days to make progress, to hold on to his promises and all to the praise of God.
we turn now uh, to pray for others. Let us pray. Father, in these uncertain days of unprecedented change, we bring to you the unchanging one, our prayers for others. We pray for the myriad of medical professionals who are working across the world to protect individuals and to combat the new virus, COVID-19. We pray especially for those within our congregation and community. We pray that they might have energy, health and stamina to withstand the long hours demanded of them and we ask that the virus would not overwhelm the NHS. We also pray for the elderly and the vulnerable, those undergoing treatment, the lonely, the frightened and anxious, and those on the margins of our society, particularly the homeless, those in shelters, detention centres and prisons. We pray for young families and the challenge of caring for children at this time of change. We pray for children confused by all that is happening. We pray for our young people who've had to postpone exams and are unclear about what the next year holds. We pray for family cohesion at this time. We pray for those worried about finances, for those who are concerned about their jobs and businesses, for those who work on the front line in our shops and other public services. We pray for our political leaders in Westminster and Stormont, in your common grace, grant them wisdom. We pray for our world with its additional problems, for the conflict in Yemen and Syria, locusts in northeast Africa and Asia, those who live in abject poverty and those who are victims of trafficking. Whilst many have to self-isolate and feel imprisoned in their own homes, we pray for thousands of Christian believers across the world who are incarcerated because of their faith or face discrimination because of their confession of Christ. By your word and spirit, help us to trust that you govern all things by your secret providence and that you can use the changes of these days to bring about real and necessary change in your church across Europe. Indeed, send new reformation, revival and renewal. And may our hearts and the hearts of many be open to the gospel, to know freedom and experience two true grace and peace that come in Jesus Christ alone. And together we pray the words that he has taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen.
And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all this day and forevermore. Amen.